Hello, and welcome to the Physical Therapy Owners Club podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Shields. And today we're going, doing a little deviation of what we normally do with the podcast. Um, I do have a frequent flyer guest, our favorite financial advisor, Eric Miller, on with us from Econologics. Eric, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. And for those who are listening, it's not just Eric who is on the episode, but it's also um, my mastermind group, the Physical Therapy Millionaires Mastermind, which includes six PT owners from across the country. And they've uh, we, we've invited Eric to be part of the mastermind and, and present on the topic today, which is how to get through a cash flow crunch, which is kind of an issue for PT owners, especially at the beginning of the year when deductibles come into play and maybe there's a reset from patients after the holidays where things tend to slow down at least for a couple of weeks. Um, but if that gets prolonged, of course, that could be an issue, but it, it is timely for anyone who else who's in a cash flow crunch. It could happen any time of the year, right? But uh, he's joining us in the mastermind. He's going to present to the mastermind. He might ask questions of the individuals of the group and they could ask questions of him. So if you hear other voices, just know that this is a presentation that's happening amongst the mastermind for this month. So again, thanks for joining us, Eric. Thanks guys for having him on. And I'll turn the time over to you, Eric. Okay, good. Well, uh, all right, guys. Well, here we go. It's a, it's a topic that I know that that we don't like to have to, to talk about very much because, you know, when you're in a cash flow crunch, that usually means that bad things are happening. But I can just tell you this, you know, and I've and I've worked with all types of practice owners in all different stages of their financial journey. I've yet to meet anyone that did not at some point in their career have to deal with a cash flow crunch at some point in time. So uh, it is it's it, it was for me, it was interesting because. When I started um, working with practice owners, uh, you know, look for the for most of you, the reality is is that the business is the main generator of income for your households. And I know that most of you don't always want to be in that financial condition, but the reality is is that when you're getting your practice and it's, you know, you're trying to build it, it is it is the main generator of income. So if it has a cash flow crunch, that that has a direct impact. Uh, on your household. So um, when I started to see that, of course, as an advisor, because I know that's where a lot of my, my clients' money is coming from, I'm like, okay, well, what, what are some actions that you can take that will, you know, allow you to, to get over whatever the, the cash flow crunch is? Uh, so, you know, I did a lot of, you know, study and observation and, and, you know, look to see what other people had done and come up and I came up with a list of things that you can do to salvage your business when you are in a cash flow crunch. I think it says it all. It's, it's very, it's aptly titled, I think. Um, so, uh, what I'll, what I'll do is just go through some of these, uh, these items, uh, and there is a sequence to them in terms of the action steps that one would take when you're confronted with, you know, a cash flow crunch. And I guess, you know, defining cash flow crunch is what it's, it's when you are, when more money is going out than what is coming in. Uh, you know, you could define a cash flow crunch that way. Uh, but I also wanted to make sure that I associated like what, what role you're playing when you, when you utilize these actions, because again, if you've ever heard me talk, you know, a, a lot of what we talk about is that you have three roles in your business. You have your owner role, you have your executive role, and you have your practitioner role. And I wanted to try to align what these actions were with, you know, what role you're playing when you're trying to correct it. So um, I'll go over that as well as, as we go through this. Uh, so just to start, I guess the, the first thing that that I have everyone do, and I actually I, I just had a conversation today with a with a he was actually in the chiropractic industry, but he was having an issue with with cash flow. And you know, the first thing that that I tell everyone is that when you're having a cash flow crunch, the most important, the most vital the most necessary thing that you have to do is that you have to go back in and reestablish the purpose, the vision, and the mission of the organization with everyone. Okay. Uh, I know that there are external factors 
of why you know your business cash flow can be interrupted but i will say that 99.9 percent .9 of it is an inside job okay of why you are the where where you at okay you can blame the external factors but more likely than not it's an inside job of why it's of why it is in the condition that it's in Okay. It sounds like you're speaking a little bit from experience. Like you've just seen it too many times. I mean, seriously, can you go, do you mind going into that just a little bit of maybe either examples or situations? Yeah, well, I think as, 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 we go, yeah, as we go through this, I think what you'll see is like the emergency never just happens. I mean, when the emergency occurs, it happens really, really fast, right? Like a catastrophe happens really, really fast but nothing breaks down over a short term period of time. It's because that there were a lot of out points that were being created that you let fester that led to the emergency. Mm. Okay. So whenever you see, I mean, you can, you can utilize this for a marriage for, for whatever it would be, you know, it's like, you just don't get divorced overnight. Right. It's like, there were a lot of things that were not handled or confronted prior to the emergency. Now, when the emergency or the catastrophe happens, it happens super fast, okay? And it's hard. Um, but I say that because there are a lot of things that you could have done that you didn't that, that were leading up to what happened, you know, to, to cause the cash flow crunch. So you if I just shared an example yeah. here. So one of the members of our group, Pratik, um, he decided in early December, he shared with do you mind if I share your, your plan for handling the beginning of the year issues critique? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. I'll, and I'll just summarize really quickly, but he decided and he shared it with the group was he decided in early December that they weren't going to have a slow period at the beginning of January. Like yeah. they, he'd been in business long enough to know that there is a slow period because of multiple factors at the beginning of January. And so the idea was to decide number one, there wasn't going to be a slow period get that expression through the organization to lead out on that. And then, then from there decide, these are the things that we're going to do such that it is not a slow period. We're going to talk to our patients well before the holidays about continuing their plan of care. So they continue to get better and how not coming in for a week or two because of holidays or beginning of the year is going to disrupt their planet, disrupt their progress. And, and then also make out calls to past patients so that they come in at the beginning of the year instead of waiting and putting that front of mind. He, he had a list of what, seven, eight things critique that, that made it so that they weren't slow at the beginning of the year. Yeah, that's, and is that, I, I think that that goes to what you're talking to. Pretty much. It's just a disagreement that, that, you know, because we can all come up with a thousand different reasons of why things are happening, but it doesn't really solve the problem. So you just kind of like this, you have to have some level of disagreement of, Whatever it is, you know, I hear this all the time. Well, it's that time of the season. It's, you know, it's, this is traditionally a slow period, you know, and there, I'm sure there's validity to it, but, you know, you, you know, you have to be like, okay, well, what can we do proactively so that maybe the effects of that aren't as, as hard as they usually are mm -hmm. or as impactful as they usually are. Okay. I'm not saying that there aren't external factors. Cause I mean, if the government shuts you down, what are you going to do? That's an external factor. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that 99.9% .9 of the time it's an, in, it's because of inside factors that are causing it, the cash flow crunch. And in this situation, yes, you reestablish purpose, vision, mission. These are team meetings. These are conversations that you have with your team. Do you let them know that there's a cash flow issue? Yeah, heck yeah. You know, I yeah. think one of the worst things that you can do is not communicate with your staff about money. Mm. And I know a lot of people don't like to do that, but I can, I can just tell you that it's because again, you got to remember, and I'll go back to this, you know, and I've said this before, an organization will try to spend every dollar that it makes and then some, but it will also make what it thinks it needs to make to survive. So when you as the owner say to this, to the organization, guys, we need to make this amount if we're going to keep our jobs, if we're going to continue to help people, if we're going to, you know, we want to bonus out, you got to get the buy-in from everyone, okay, that this is what the, 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 the target is because, you know, that kind of goes to the second point right here, but there, there does the first thing you have to do, because if, if, if something is dying, Right. If an organization is dying and when you start having a cash flow crunch, that to me is an indicator that the organization is starting to die.
Okay. Not to the point where it's going to close down, but the production is lower. You know, it's starting to, to go, to go in that direction. You have to imbue life back into that organization it may sound corny. It may sound, you know, kind of like a rah, rah, you know, just one speech ain't, is, is going to do it, but you know, you have to get the purpose back in the organization of why you're there in the first place. Right. And everybody just has to buy into that, that belief, look, we're here to relieve people from pain or discomfort, whatever it is, whatever your purpose of the organization, make sure it's memorialized and get people reinvigorated. Um, you know, people do things not, they're, they're not just money motivated, you know, duty, there's other things that motivate people and, and really getting people, you know, reinvigorated and what the purpose of the organization is, I think is the most important thing that you can do to start off with. Yeah. People buy based on emotion. Yes. And, and not just material things, but also they buy your purpose and vision and mission based on emotion, right? They are aligned uh, through emotion. Yeah. And, and this also will help you identify the people that are not, which as we go down the list, you'll find is probably one of the reasons why you're in a cash flow crunch in the first place. Right. Is because you have somebody in there that is basically working against you. Mm -hmm. But the second one, of course, would be making sure that you're operating on the right targets. And again, to, to your point, you know, I think most people are way underestimating how much the, the organization actually needs to bring in to maintain solvency and solvency isn't just meeting your expenses. It's having more, which of course means that you have to include your profits, you know, your reserves, your taxes, you know, expansion, whatever, you know, we can do a whole nother webinar on that, but that has to be part and parcel of what the organization thinks it needs to make. And that's what I'm saying is like the, the whole organization should know like, Oh God, this is our make break number. Okay. Now they don't have to know all the expenses, but they should know what the make break number is internally. You know, that you factored in your buffers into that equation. Okay. But the necessity, the necessity is on making that make break number. Okay. And it has to be correct. Otherwise, if it's not, then, you know, I'll just go back to the, the two gold rules of income and expenses. The, the, the business will try to spend everything that it makes and then some. You know, I, I had an experience with an, an, a veteran physical therapist on my team and we were in the slow season in Arizona um, and new patient numbers had gone quite low. And I was with her in the back room at lunch and, and I just said, you know, our, we're going to have so many new patients this week. We could get down to so many visits this week. That, and she looked at me with deer in the headlights. Look, like she had no clue, uh, no perspective of what those numbers meant whatsoever. And I immediately thought that's my fault. They don't know like what's good, what's bad, what we need to hit, what the expectations are to simply break even or, you know, cover their themselves or cover the expenses in the product. They just had no clue. And that's a fault, the fault of the owner at that point. Yeah, I, I think I think it's okay to communicate. I mean, I, you're not going to give them every single, you know, nuance of your expenses, but I think that number is really important for everyone to know right. what that just just going on that that basic datum that I that I say, you know, about the organization spending more than the, everything that it makes and then but it will make exactly what it thinks to make. Okay, and I've, I've just seen too many examples of that in small organizations, in big organizations, in governments, in, you know, whatever organization you want to pick, that, that, that seems to be a natural law of, of finance amongst mm -hmm. people that that, yeah. that occurs. Okay. Um, you know, obviously your promotional activities, you, you shouldn't decrease it. I mean, we saw a lot of this, especially when the pandemic hit people, the first thing that they were cutting is their promotional activities making again making your good works known is promotional activities and that's the last thing you want to do is decrease those promotional activities at that point in time i know it seems counterintuitive but you know i think that's that's an area that a lot of people will cut but that's the thing that you have to you know increase because you have a problem with not having enough new patients in the door Mm -hmm. you know, to see and seeing patients. So you really have to make sure that your promotional activity. So it's just a counterintuitive thing that first thing you want to cut is your marketing and promotion. And it's really the last thing that you should do. Yeah. David was a good example of this. Um, he shared with me how he's 
he's increasing his budget marketing budget here the first month of the year. Isn't that right, David? You increased it quite a bit. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I doubled what the normal spend was. Mm -hmm. It works every time. Okay, the the next one has a lot to do again with with money and speed. Okay, now money loves speed. Okay, and I say that because um, when you work fast, okay, money loves speed in that in that in in that respect. And when you're facing insolvency or a cash flow crunch, it's kind of like you know if you got sports fans here, what what do most coaches do? when the team isn't performing as it should they round them up and say let's just get back to basics okay what is it that ideally our organization needs to do in order for us to meet our make break number okay i just need to get everyone back to doing their jobs but i have i have to make sure they do it with a lot more intention and speed okay mm -hmm. take time out of the equation wherever you can that's a mantra that you'll hear in this office all the time take time out of the equation as much as you can and you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. in terms of of time you know patients getting scheduled patients getting called back you know programs getting implemented um billing and collections you know aggressively getting money in you know wherever you can take time out of the equation that will increase the speed and and money loves speed and that will that will definitely increase the production and, and the income by doing that collecting money at the time of visit yeah. For, for many owners that can be difficult, especially during these deductible periods where the patient might have a $2,000 deductible and they don't collect part of that deductible at each visit. And that's a, a trap that we fell into is we wait until the EOB came back and then bill the patient for that deductible amount instead of collecting at least a portion uh, at each visit that would go towards their deductible. Yeah. And, and that's the speed that we're talking about. Let's not wait, uh, you know, four to six weeks to find, to then go back and bill the patient. Then collecting is rather difficult. Let's get it at the time of service. Yeah. And, and really, but it really just makes sure get, get people to do their jobs. Right. right. I mean, that's going to be, a, that's going to be your kind of your executive and your owner function is I just need people to go back and do their jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And find out, and you'll find out, you know, maybe where people have a disagreement or, um, you know, someone that you may have to confront and get rid of. Right. The next one really, you know, probably doesn't uh, apply too much for the PT industry as far as promoting highly profitable and easily executable services, um, you know, because you guys, but, you know, I guess to your, to the point here, it would be, you know, what are those income sources in your business that you can deliver quickly and have good profit margins and you can get paid for maybe some cash services that you that you have cash based services that you're trying to you know um, deliver you know do those things that are highly profitable and easily executed especially mm -hmm. when, you, when you're in a cash flow crunch okay because right now you're just trying to get money in as fast as you can right, right? so what is that it's going to be good profit margin services and those that you can deliver really, really quickly so mm -hmm. that you can get the money in for that, whatever that would be, you know, in, in your practice. Do you find many, just an idea, Eric, considering that, do you find many physical therapists that you work with that have massage therapists on staff that can sell massage therapy packages during this, uh, during a cash flow crunch or promote that a little bit more? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I think, again, this goes to like looking at your facility and that you have so many square footage in that facility, okay? How do I maximize the production out of that facility? And what are the income sources that, that I have available to me to deliver in this facility? If I got a 5,000 square foot facility, you know, and I, I can see so many patient visits, but maybe, you know, we can use this space for massage therapy or this space for dry needling or whatever it would be, right? right. Whatever services you could right. try to maximize the efficiency and the capacity of that of that space mm -hmm. um, that should be really the game like everyone everyone here should be able to name like if my facility were operating at optimum capacity i had maximum number of patients maximum number of staff you know we were busting out the doors you know my reimbursements were getting paid on time i had some cash-based businesses what could my facility do mm -hmm. in revenue because that's going to be the 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 
maximum amount of value that that practice will provide you and your household, not just in enterprise value, but in cash flow to the household as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of reasons why you would want to make sure that you get to that, you know, to get to that number. That's a great exercise. Yeah. It's a, it's one that we try to do with everybody, you mm -hmm. know, is really making sure they understand what that number is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, you know, and I've said this a million times and maybe some of you guys have heard this, maybe some of you haven't, but you know, I'll, I'll make a, a, a bet with everyone when I say what your biggest expense is. And, you know, I'll say, especially in the PT world where, you know, you're looking at 55 and percent or higher of staff wages being the norm of right. your, of your biggest expense. And most of you think that's your biggest expense. And then I say, it's not your biggest expense is money that you should have made, but you didn't. And that uh, has a lot to do with your, the size of your facility. And are you getting the most out of it that you possibly could? Because if you have a facility that can do 250,000 a month and you're doing 150,000 a month, that's a hundred thousand dollars of lost income. Right. That you never get back. Okay. Okay. So anyway, I thought we kind of went off on a tangent there, but no, that's okay. great. Yeah. So again, you're in a cash flow crunch. You, you have to inspect your cash flow lines. Okay. So when I when I say that, like money, you know, again, I know it sounds kind of, you know, I don't know what term to use, but money is an energy and there are things that can obstruct the flow. Of, of money coming into your organization. Mm -hmm. So you have to do inspect your income lines. And, you know, again, I've had people that they started to see their cat, their, their numbers go down and they didn't do anything about it. You know, they waited two, three, four months. I'm like, no, 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 no. When you start seeing that number go down, you attack that immediately and find out why it is that this is occurring. OK, and a lot of the time you're going to find you may have the wrong people on your collections lines. OK, you need someone that has a bulldog mentality when it comes to getting money into that organization, a bulldog mentality, not afraid to say no, not afraid to ask for money, not afraid to offend. OK, because, you know, that it's it's just that it's just that important. I mean, solvency is the most important part of your organization is, is being solvent. So, you know, unfortunately you get, you get people that uh, are having, and again, I know everyone's going to have the, their issues, but when you start having people on your collection lines that are always having problems that are always having personal problems that, you know, are sympathetic, you know, to hard luck peep the cases, or they just don't have a disdain for money. Like you better not have those people on your finance lines. They will literally kill you. Yeah. Those people that have a hard time asking for a copay. Yeah. Uh, they get, that can't work. Nope. No. And this is where also it's really difficult for PT owners to, well, they don't know what they need to assess when it comes to the billing and collections reports. If they don't know, or if they haven't had experience with it um, and they have, and they're not sitting down with their biller on a monthly basis, they, number one, don't know what they're looking at. Number when they're given reports. Number two, they don't know if those reports are good or bad. Yeah. They, you know, they don't have perspective. And number three, they don't know how to hold their billers accountable. And so that makes it really difficult for them to assess the, those cash flow lines. So you would, you would definitely need to have some percentages, some, some basic metrics that you would, that I'm sure you could provide that too, of like what you should be looking for in, in an ideal. Again, this all comes back to like the ideal scene, mm -hmm. what that looks like. Cause how do you know if the wheels are off the bus, if you don't know what the looks like when the wheels are on the bus. Right. right? And so, that's where you need to talk to uh, your coach or if you don't have one, me or talk to Will Humphreys, he'll do a free audit for you. Yes. Right. For sure. But yeah, I, I can't stress that enough in terms of, you know, people with a lot of personal problems, you, you just cannot have them on your finance lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. You just can't. Um, and I'm not talking about like, you know, because everyone's going to have personal problems every now and then, but they have to keep that off because again, sometimes these people become a repellent of money. Mm -hmm. They do, you know, and I, I see the characteristics of, of those people. They just repel money coming into the organization. And I think I've said, uh, uh, 
maybe I've said this before on the podcast, but you know, the, the two miracles of business, and this actually is going to lead into number eight, uh, which is amazing what happens. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. Two miracles of business is number one, uh, the day that somebody shows up for help, like that first day when you got your first patient, you're like, oh my God, oh, yeah. this, this actually may work, right? And the next miracle of business is the moment that you get rid of a toxic individual out of your organization. I have never <laughs> seen people, I've never seen revenue increase more than when they actually spotted the, the negative source. And it's usually just one, okay? One person in the organization. Okay. And it is, it's amazing what happens when you root out that toxicity of the organization. It, it just like, it just goes like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, a question that I'll ask is, and this isn't like if you're having a cash flow crunch, like, I mean, if it happens like once, okay. But if it's like a perpetual thing, if it's something that's continuing, you got to look and, and find out the person in the organization that's actually trying to do this to you. Because it is a who, and it is, it's usually one person, and it, it's amazing what happens when you root that out of the organization. This is your owner hat, because you're responsible for the morale and the culture of the organization, and if you can't get rid of that person, confront them and get rid of them, I don't care how important you think they are to the organization, then it's going to, you know, it's going to keep a cap on what you can do. Um, yeah, so. One of our owners in our group experienced this this last year, right, Mike? <laughs> Do you want to share really quickly I, what happened, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I can share. Yeah, I had, you know, honestly, I kept someone on for a really long time for just good reasons, relatively. It was a compassionate thing. Um, and then beginning of the last year, um, things happened where we were able to kind of give an opportunity to go out. And then we've increased our revenue significantly in the company. Um, this last year, we probably doubled our revenue uh, just simply by uh, putting key players in place and actually bolstering those that are willing to work well. So it was a hard move that I didn't want to make. Uh, I made some choices to kind of get that to correct. And it was just um, pretty significant. So, yeah. Yeah. You didn't say it just kind of like you went up like five or 10%. You said you doubled your revenue. It was ridiculously significant. Uh, say that again. You doubled your revenue, doubled right? Your revenue. That's yeah. crazy. Okay. It was, that, it was significant. Yeah. You can see the importance of that then. Like it's, I mean, an organization is made up of people. And unfortunately, there's going to be two and a half percent of people out there that just don't want anything good to happen to anybody. And, for, and, and as you expand your organization, okay, to maybe five people, to 10 people, to 20 people, to 30 people, you know, you're, you're just going to have to realize that the law of large numbers is, is going to affect your organization at some point. You're going to bring in one of these people. It's just finding out who they are, getting rid of them, and doing it fast. Uh, it's just when you let them linger, it, it just, it, you can tell the weight of the organization, what it does, and it, it's not a good thing. I should have done it six months before then. Yeah. I think everybody has that story. We had that last year in our organization. We had to get rid of two people because, you know, we found out there was some underlying toxicity. You know, I had, I had been not doing well before that. So, I, I mean, I have experience on this too. It's like, you know, we do the same thing. It's like, why am I not feeling good? My morale's not high. And we just had to inspect and, you know, find out where it was. And then, you know, you can, you can see what happens, but it's probably the one thing that will, you know, give rise to your cash flow faster than anything else is just, mm -hmm. is really rooting out that, that person and, and, uh, and going from there, right. you know, the next one to increase prices. I wish you guys could, you know, just increase your prices. Like <laughs> all my other practice owners, unfortunately you can't do nice. that. So, um, this is where you just have to add, you know, additional services Pro to your point, Nate, you know, you have to add additional profit services, uh, additional income sources, um, you know, just because inflation is, is, is increasing your wages every single year, but not your profits. Yeah. Some so, owners are getting a little bit of extra cash flow from dry needling services or laser and musculoskeletal ultrasound. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then the last thing, and, and I did this for a reason the the last thing is, is then cut expenses. So, I mean, there were nine steps 
that you do before you even start thinking about cutting expenses. Okay. And I did that because this is the last area to examine because, you know, it's very rare that I find practice owners really spending money on things like overspending on, on certain things. Okay. It's, it's kind of rare that I see that. So, but you know, there are some, you know, you can go and look and see where maybe some needless expenses would be. Um, but I, you know, from our viewpoint, marketing, consulting, anybody that's trying to push you forward, anybody that's trying to give you, uh, hold you accountable, anything that is going to expand the organization, I, I would never cut that as an expense. Um, but I'm sure there's other things that you can look for, sorry, uh, in your organization that, but that would be the last thing that I would look at as far as cutting, as far as cutting expenses is concerned, just because it's just faster to make the money than to try yeah. to go through line item by line item on yeah. everything that you have and try to cut that expense. Yeah. The knee jerk is to cut expenses and, um, yeah. and, and that it doesn't get you very far. I love that you had, you say, yeah, have you checked the previous nine steps? <laughs> Cause not yeah. until you're really clear that you've, uh, done all nine steps prior to this point should you look at your expense line and and look you know are these nine steps uh, you know one one step is is not going to solve all of your problems but i think if you collectively do all these things i just have a i i've seen too many people that have implemented some of these or part of these mm -hmm. uh that has you know allowed them to you know remedy their situation pretty quickly but mm -hmm. i just would not let uh, a, a cash flow crunch. Definitely don't ignore it. You know, if you start seeing that your collections are going down, you know, don't just like kind of hope and pray they're going to go up. You got to attack that almost immediately mm -hmm. and figure out why that's occurring. And that's probably the biggest issue that I, that I, I see a lot of practice owners do. They, they may just go months and months without mm -hmm. really attacking that. And then all of a mm -hmm. sudden it's like, oh my gosh, what's going on right now? Right. The um, one of the questions from our group from David was where where would you borrow money from? What are good sources of funds versus bad or worse sources of funds when it comes to a cash flow crunch? As far as like uh, where to tap into credit yeah. lines and those but, kinds yeah, of things, I, yeah. I think that's where you're going, David. I, of course, the the best source of funds is to have a reserve account. <laughs> that would be ideal. But when you're looking yeah. past that, where would you look? Next? Yeah, I mean, I think again, you know, the having a two month reserve fund would be would be optimal. Uh, but the uh, I would say, you know, if you have really anywhere. I mean, a business line of credit, if you had one of those, uh, but a lot of, but you're not going to get a business line of credit if, if you're in a cash flow crunch. So a lot of these things <laughs> you have to prepare for prior to that, knowing that at some point, but look, I know if I have a practice on the Northeast, it's quite likely that there's going to be a snowstorm that's going to shut down my business for a week or two. Okay. Like, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know it's likely going to happen. Okay. And I always got surprised when I got a phone call from someone that had a practice in Boston or something like that. And they were like, well, you know, we're shut down by a snowstorm. I don't know where I'm going to get the money from. Like, well, didn't you know that it snowed in Boston during the winter time? Okay. <laughs> so it's probably, you know, something that you want to plan for. So, you know, having credit line, business credit lines are always going to be good. You know, in, you know, in our system, we have, we do put a premium on making sure that clients continue to put money into, uh, into assets or investments that you can, you can access that there's liquidity features there, mm -hmm. whether you can borrow from the asset, whether you can get a credit line against the asset. Like I'm all for having cash and assets, but I also want to make sure that you have plenty of credit lines you know, attached to those assets mm -hmm. in case you do need to tap into them. It's a phone call away to be able to, to, to get access to it. And, so, and I think you're referencing certain life insurance policies that can also could, be lines yeah. of credit as well. Right. Yeah. Or bro brokerage accounts where you can get brokerage securities back lines, a, a security, right. a security back line of credit against a brokerage account. Uh, you know, you can tap into a lot of different things. The, the, the key is, is just making sure that 
uh, you have access to all of these things. If you have a home, having a home equity line of credit that, mm -hmm. that you know, if, if it's accessible, same with your building. If you got a building and you got equity in there, get a line of credit against it. Again, got it. the banks will be more than happy to lend to you when the financial seas are calm. Mm -hmm. But the moment that you can't, that you demonstrate that you're in a cash flow crunch, they're to be like, ha ha, bye bye. You know, we're not going to talk to you. So this is like where the, the planning preparation comes in and you know quite likely when you when you do all this planning when you do have open credit pools when you do have all these things you know when a when a cash flow crunch does come it's it's not as impactful on you right, right. it doesn't impact your your household doesn't impact your morale doesn't impact your emotional well-being because it does have a, a pretty big impact on your emotional well-being mm -hmm. you know when that when that happens when you um so some owners might have one clinic out of two, three or four, five clinics that um, financially isn't doing as well as the others. And I'm assuming you recommend that they each have the, each clinic has their standalone financials, right? Well, uh, it, it really all depends on your transition plan. Like, what are you, what are you planning to do okay. from a transition standpoint? But, you know, there is a, you know, a concept of um, trying to, compartmentalize all the the clinics so that mm -hmm. they're standalone to that degree maybe from like an asset protection point of view um oh, sure and, and and a financial point of view too but that way you can look and see you know am i subsidizing this practice am i willing to do that and how long am i willing to do that for yeah i you know? i guess i just bring up the point that it, it's important i think for owners to do some kind of even if they're not separated by the veil of limited liability corporation but at least financially their books are separate yeah so you can see that sometimes the overall organization is doing well but one singular clinic might not be doing as well financially and so it's important to recognize simple cash flow issues in, in those singular clinics outside yeah. of the other three or four yeah for sure so i mean you should understand how to read a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet and Maybe that's what we'll do. We'll do something we'll something on that, like making sure that everyone understands how to read those things. Pro profit and loss statement and do yes. a webinar, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I got you. Any other questions from the group or, or even comments that you want to share with Eric? Mike, you put something in the chat there. Yeah, I was just going to mention, uh, I find it interesting. Your list is pretty all-inclusive i think not just for times of cash flow crunch but just generally it seems like these are good business practices that we should pretty regularly stay on top of regardless of our financial situation because i think that would trend us better to you know having more cash on a regular basis i think that's 100 percent correct uh they're, they're basics right and and the reason that the cash flow crunch occurred is because the basic actions went out and so when you get these basics back in, um, I think it, it uh, you're, to your point, it definitely allows the organization to be more stable. And you, I mean, you're gonna go, you're gonna have your ups and downs. I think the point is, is that you just don't wanna have those downs that, that are super significant, you know? And, um, you know, just making sure that you're putting these things in play so that to your point, you know, it, um, you can correct these really, really quickly. And uh, yeah, so that makes sense. Kind of as a follow-up to that, if you don't mind, um, are there any other maybe best practices that you didn't have on a list? Like you mentioned it a moment ago, the you know, reviewing your profit and loss statement on maybe a monthly basis. Uh, are there other keys that you would put into this list if it wasn't so much a cash flow crunch, but like a good practice act? Oh, uh, let me think about that. I'll second the monthly uh, financials review with your CPA <laughs> for sure. That was yeah. huge for me. Well, you know, for certainly the frequency of, of talking with your, your financial team, I think it needs to happen a lot more frequent than what it does. Um, just because, especially if you're growing quickly, uh, you know, your tax liability, I'm sure we've all had that moment where we got a call on April 15th or whatever, 14th from our accountant was like, Oh, by the way, you're going to owe a lot more in taxes than what you thought you did. Right. Because you didn't, there, there wasn't much communication up to that point right. that, and you were growing and they, you know, and again, they're pretty reactive 
in their approach. They just want your reports from the previous 12 months. So you got to be super proactive as a, as a business owner, knowing that, oh my gosh, I'm growing. I, I should probably make sure that we're setting aside the proper amount for my tax estimates and that there's some planning that's going, that's involved prior to that so that I can address any non-optimum tax liability that I may have. That's a good one. Um, I don't know, Mike, I probably need to think about that. I can probably come up with a list of another 20 things as well. Um, you know what, if you hold on, I, there, well, I don't want to, there are some other things that, that I know that we had talked about in the past, like some, some characteristics that you have to be, uh, that people are uncomfortable being. Like I had mentioned that you have to be a bulldog on collections, right? Like, I think that that, that, that mentality is important. Um, I think that, you know, you have to be able to understand all the lines in the organization so that you can spot where, where the product, where the resistance is coming from in the organization. Like I I'd mentioned that before, like, I think a real skill that you have that you need to develop is, you know, you, you know, the lines of your organization, someone, you know, is marketed to or referred to, they come into the organization, they sit down, they go to the front desk, they go to a treatment room, they get cared for, they come out, they pay. Sounds so simple, right? then why does it get messed up in so many different places? So your ability, I think, to be able to, to un know exactly what the ideal scene would look like for every, every host and every division of the organization is really, really key so that you can kind of spot where, where, it's, where the wheels are coming off, you know? So I think that's something that, that we can all do a little bit better. And that's just being able, that's having the time to wear your owner and executive hat and that not just a, being a practitioner the whole time. That was something that came up last week in, in that I was asking an owner about their clinical statistics and he gave me the statistics. And I, then I asked, well, what about the individual provider statistics? And he hadn't gone that deep with the stats. And what my experience is, is that sometimes even if the clinical statistics look fairly good or average or a little bit above average, and there are two or three providers underneath it, when you dive down into the individual provider statistics, two, two out of the three are usually working really well. And a third one is being average or below average and needs to be addressed. And so if the, if the message was to the whole clinic that we want to improve our statistics or, hey, you guys are doing well, then those two out of the three are saying, well, we're really busting our butt, knowing that the third one, typically they know that the third one isn't producing as well. And whereas it's more effective if you can isolate that one provider and talk to them specifically about their down stats. Yeah. There's a question about how good is a, a, a CPA in avoiding a cash flow crunch? Would you recommend setting aside for how much would you, what would you recommend setting aside for a good CPA that is a tax strategist on a monthly basis? I mean, it really all depends on what your, your income is, but uh, I mean, I can tell you just by stats alone that most of you guys are paying Twenty to forty thousand dollars in taxes more than what you probably should. So whatever the amount that you would pay to someone to recoup that amount would be worth the investment. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. If you have to pay him a couple thousand dollars to save twenty, that's good investment, right? Yeah. Okay. I see the. Yeah. I see the math. I see where yeah. you're going there. So I think that's, <laughs> it, it is, uh, it's a reality, I know. Uh, and, you know, the, the higher your income is, the more, the more um, accessible, not accessible, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Well, there's just additional tax strategies that you're now right. eligible for, eligible mm -hmm. for, that's what I was right. looking for, yeah. um, that a lot of people just don't um, probably present to you. Yeah. Um, as you get into that, in that three to 400,000 income range to 500,000 income range, you really mm -hmm. become eligible for some really cool things. Cool. Well, Hey, thanks for your time today, Eric, especially joining the mastermind group. If people wanted to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Uh, they can just uh, go to econologics.com uh, or you can just email me at uh, Eric at econologics.com. Cool. Uh, and get my information there. And we got a lot of these things we have are in download form. So if you go to our website, uh, I'll have the cash flow crunch checklist there. Mm -hmm. And we probably have, you know, 
12 other checklists that were that were built for practice owners and your experience and uh, all the things that you guys go through from you know, beginning to end, uh, exit planning, you know, checklists. And I think that would be some other things too, that you could mm-hmm. download that would give you some best practices as well. For sure. Um, yeah. so, well, and then, yeah, that, that, uh, exit strategies or exit checklist, Mike, to your point where you asked for things that were just good business strategies, that exit, exit strategy checklist is really, yep. really good. It was, it's huge. Yeah. There's a lot of good things on there about what to do to get your practice into a, a more ready, uh, or a, a, a better condition so that it's as valuable as possible when you decide to transition out. Right. And it overall makes it a better value practice, even if yeah. you don't exit. Right. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for your time to Eric. I appreciate it, man. Okay, guys. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.